Salve, salve, Bahia Cast. Estamos aqui mais uma vez, dessa vez, um programa gravado, porque nós estamos recebendo um artista internacional. Então, é, a gente vai ter, da mesma forma que tivemos com o Jamie Hickinson, é, uma entrevista toda em inglês que mais tarde será legendada para o nosso público, que a maioria é, é embora estejamos crescendo, né? <risos> Abroad, mas a gente, é, a maioria do nosso público é falante de português, então a gente está tendo esse cuidado de gravar o programa e legendar depois para poder a gente é, compartilhar com vocês aqui no nosso canal. Então, é, vou fazer o giro aqui dos nossos apoiadores e patrocinadores e a gente vai chamar o nosso convidado da nossa equipe aqui, que é Walter São Cabeça na direção técnica, Jorge Bio na direção geral do programa, além de mim aqui, os nossos apoiadores. A gente aqui no Baiacast faz o giro para mim, Cabas. Tá rolando, tá rolando. Tá rolando? Pode falar. Mas aqui não. É, Sampaio Sabores também, o melhor hambúrguer gourmet da Bahia, é, ali na República de, de Brotas. É, Doutor Enzo Querino também, odontologia especializada. A Zion fazendo o nosso marketing digital. A Carpon também, nos apoiando com vários looks interessantes. Copo cheio em pódio de bebidas, sempre trazendo alegria aqui para o Bahia Cast. E o CTS, Centro Técnico de Salvador. Você sabe que a nossa economia está se recuperando e a gente... É, sabe que esse momento é decisivo se você tem uma, uma vantagem competitiva no mercado. E é justamente essa possibilidade que você tem fazendo um curso técnico com o CTS, um dos nossos grandes apoiadores. Então a gente agradece e a partir desse momento a gente vai é, seguir a nossa ma, nosso bate-papo aqui com o Duane em inglês. Hi Duane! Bless up, man. Bless up. <laughs> Thanks for coming. The pleasure is mine, bro. Great honor. Mm -hmm. I'd like to, in advance, thank also to Rafa, que está aqui também. <laughs> He's also here. This is a, a very important guy uh, for reggae matters. Yeah, I mean, I've known him for for many years. You know, um, followed his reputation. You know, yes. throughout the years. Yes, it's amazing the amount of things he managed to get done during <laughs> that time and still be active in, in in reggae music. You know, I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> yeah. This is very important for us. Uh, he's been, uh, he's having a great, great, great achievement year mm. after year, bringing you guys. Yeah. But not only that, no? uh, also as a uh, 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 radio guy that keeps uh, uh, posting things and and making reggae music more accessible for yes. people all the time. So it's a very, very, very valuable work. Thanks, Rafa. Most definitely, man. Yes. It is. <laughs> oh, Thank you very much. Once again, please. Obrigado, Sérgio. <laughs> Depois de uma apresentação dessa aí, eu fico até encabulado. <laughs> Obrigado. Mas é merecido. Valeu, Thank you, Duane. Very well deserved. He's a great guy. Duane Stephenson, yes. not the first time here in Salvador. No, it's not. It's my second time around. Um, the first time was a little bit brief. I, I was a guest performer um, for the Whalers. No, you know, it was a great event. I enjoyed it totally. But no, I'm definitely looking forward to, you know, performing my own show here, you know, a full scale show for the first time. You know, I've been looking forward to it for many years because I have been following the people that has been supporting me from here. You know, and yes. um, definitely they've been consistent throughout the years and keeps me motivated. Yes, that's important because mm -hmm. you know that uh, always when we have the opportunity to 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 have with us international artists, mainly from our our genre that is reggae music, mm -hmm. we 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 tend to uh, reinforce those ties because you know Salvador is the most Afro-descendant city outside Africa. Yeah, I know that. You know that. Yeah, listen. <laughs> I know these things, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, and they've, all, they've, they've been a main supporter of our music since the beginning. You know, I think um, outside of, well, Europe as a whole, this is probably where we get the most support from um, this base of people. Yes. So we have a long tradition of, of uh, fighting for civil rights. Mm -hmm. So that led to lots of art artistic, cultural phenomena yes. that happened through the, throughout the years. So we have Olodum, we have uh, Iliaye, that are blocos, mm -hmm. that are association of people, that uh, they come together to go to the streets in the carnival. Uh, with music, with culture, with yeah. consciousness? You know, I, I think it's a very important thing because on this journey of life, you know, if we, we don't, you know, reinforce where we're coming from, then the future can be 
you know, a little bit more different than we would want it to be. So it's nice that, you know, this era in itself is a uh, metropolis, yes, but it still has a lot to do with being a cultural destination. And Salvador is just that, a cultural destination for many different reasons. Yes. And that was intensified in the last, I would say, 15 years uh, mm -hmm. because of Republica do Reggae. That is that great festival. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, as we were speaking, uh, uh, talking before the show start, start uh, I had, for example, uh, many opportunities to, 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 to have a direct contact with lot, mm. lots of uh, important artists such as uh, Gregory Isaacs, Dennis Brown, Icons Max Holland. in our music, yes, icons yes. in our music, both living and some that has passed, yes. which is a great honor because a lot of people that has loved reggae for many years has never met so many of those people uh, and yet to even have them on their stage, you know, um, I know another Jimmy Cliff was down here a lot at one point. I know this was like a second home for him and it kind of, yes, so, yes. you know, they show you the level of comfort that our people feel when they come here. Yes. I I went to Kingston once, mm -hmm. and I was also I, I talked to Hafa once that we were commenting about that it's, it's how these two places are so intim, intimate related. Yeah, listen, almost identical. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It is true. It's true. Um, no, not so much Kingston. Like this reminds me like of Ochoa. So I wanted was you know more um, rural towns by the sea. It's just yes, you know. A lot going on there, but still has that easygoing vibe in the undertone. Yes, you know? yes, so yes, yes. It's always great coming here, man. Look forward every time. But uh, this brings me to one thing that I, uh, it's clearly perceivable when we uh, look into your life and work. That mm. is the close relationship that you have with your place, with your community. Yes. Uh, to the point that you have this, the, the name of the first yeah. album is August. Green Stevenson from August Town. Yeah. yeah. Outer, outer, August yeah. Town. Outer, August Town. <laughs> <laughs> Jamir, Kingston, Jamir. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> And I followed from August Town. Yeah. Could you please tell us about that relationship? Um, you know, I think music for me has always been you know, a medium of getting things out that are, you know, whole inside, you know. I was never a big talker. And when I got to about 14, I started writing music. And to me, it was just writing down the emotions that I was going through at the time. This was before I added melodies to, to, um, to the words, you know. But it has been a cornerstone of who I am, you know. It's, Augustone is where I grew up. It's what I know. It's, it's um, the means in which people look at me, whether it be good, bad, or indifferent, you know. So it, it means everything to me. And the changes that has happened there has affected me more so than, you know, possibly the average person there because a lot of people who, who you know, found better left for whatever reason, you know, because... Yeah, but it's always good while people try to better themselves, you know. But for me, the question was, you know, who stays to represent the people who can't leave, you know, who can't access a different place as easily? They needed a voice, you know. People need to know that you know, um, the reputation that we garnered... Um, at the beginning of 2000 is not to the core of what August Town is. Even today, you know, it's a volatile community and, you know, a lot of people, all they see is, is, is the bad things, but there's only a few people that are involved in these things. But you know what they say? Empty barrels make the most noise. You know, so it, um, for me, it had everything to do with, even the music coming out of me has everything to do with my foundation and growing up there. You know, so... It's something that I wanted people to know because, as I say, you have to be the voice for the things that people don't see on the news about Augustown. Yes. And that, uh, once again, uh, links us in the end, at the end. Yeah. Because uh, for us here in Salvador, with all that history of fighting for civil rights and fighting mm. for equality and all that stuff, uh, brings us to, uh, to the same vibe. So it's important for us yes. uh, to, to represent the place where we came from. 
Yeah, most definitely, man. You know, um, Salvador is always known for that. And I think that's the, the glue that binds us together. We had the same struggles, so the music meant the same thing. You know, and I think that is the link that we've always had with, you know, Salvador, even a place like San Luis and maybe a, a few more yes, places. Yes, a few more Across places. Brazil, and that's, that's the link. Yes. But of course, with the difference that we are a continental play, a yeah. country, so it's, it's, it's huge. So we had from, learned from history that we have some places where we have the concentration of people that came from Africa. Yeah. And, and we know the history. But, but Salvador is one of this, the, these places in uh, São Luís do Maranhão, Rio de Janeiro. Yeah. And mais o que, galera? Salvador, Rio de Janeiro, São Luís. De que recebe que recebe teve que, uh, where we received lots of people from Africa in, in the times of the slave. Most mostly these mm. places, big places. Yeah. So uh, among them, Salvador it was the main. Place. Yeah, you know, so that's why so we that's, that's why we dance to the beat of the same drum. Yeah, you know yes. what I mean? Because despite how far they take us from the place, you know, but the drum still beat in our hearts <laughs> and minds, you know. <laughs> but you said that you started to write things and your lyrics and your feelings with yeah. 14 years. When I wrote about 14 years old. Yes. But the muse, music itself, when you when you compounded that as this is music, this is <laughs> melodies and yeah. I think that happened when I got to about 16 or 17. Um, before that, I was I was very much shy. I, I used to like avoid places, you know, that wanted me to perform. So because of that, I went to very little parties and them things. Because before the night ended, somebody always wanted me to sing as a boy, and I didn't want that, <laughs> you know. But I was always around the music. Um, it, it's something that has always interested me. You know, my uncle was a part of a band. That for many years was the touring band with Gregory Isaac. The band was called the Rhythm Kings mm. Band. You know, so for many years that was the, 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 the backing. That was the music behind Gregory Isaac. And my hunk, my uncle was the lead singer and opening act for Gregory for many years. So I used to go to all the rehearsals and stuff. So it was always interesting to me. You know, but I think you know life happened. You know, I was doing regular boy things. You know, from trying to avoid school to trying to get the girls, <laughs> <laughs> you know, to, to try to get the girls. But, you know, of course, with, you know, strong parenting, the school was, uh, wasn't an option, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But once I got to uh, close to the end of high school, I, I joined a um, young people performing arts group called the Kathy Levy Players, which was foundation in theater. So you had to do a little bit of drama, a little bit of music, mm. and a little bit of dance. I, I did, that's where I discovered that dance wasn't an option for me. <laughs> 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 yeah. I, I didn't have a dancing bone in my, in my body, you know. But It's so common for us musicians. Yeah. We do not <laughs> relate ourselves to dance. I, I don't know why. You know, it's because it's of the, the commitment we have to, to, to you know, what we're doing, you know. <laughs> in terms of pop music, lends itself to that, but we are more intense, so you have to really focus in. Let's just use that as, as the excuse, <laughs> you know. But yeah, um, so in doing theater, and then I started to learn a little bit more about the music and the, the musical side of it. You know, you know that hearing was the most important thing. That's where I actually learned that I can't sing. A Whitney Houston song or a Mariah Carey song, as I thought I could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. Because when you learn to listen, But you realize that what you're saying is right. Let's not raise right. the bars that, that much. <laughs> <laughs> Because Exactly, you know. Yeah, but that's where I started when I was about... Um, I went there when I was 16 years old. And that's when I started to really write down many other stuff. Plus, at that time... You know, things was really changing in Augustown. This was the invent of, this was the time when gangs were coming in and guns and a lot of people that you knew as older, older men, you know, they, you know, went to New York and London and those places and became Al Capone <laughs> and started to do what Al Capone did. I guess they were just emulating what they saw on TV, but it affected the community, you know, negatively. You know, because now everybody had guns and everybody tried to form their own gangs and they started to have turf wars and that kind of a foolishness. So that's that was my way of internalizing all that and putting it to melody. 
You know, but I never actually got an opportunity to use those melodies until about three years later when I recorded my first song as a member of a singing group that I was a part of called To Isis. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. and that was my first recording was um, Get Up In, which was produced by Dean Fraser. Yes. Yeah, at the time. It was first done as a member of the group, but... I wrote the song. I was the only person that knew the song. <laughs> you know, because initially when we went, he, we were there to record other songs. Because, of course, you know, everybody, every young group was trying to be boys to men. So, you know, most yeah. of the other guys write, you know, very cute, pretty songs and everything. But Dean was necessarily into that kind of vibe. So he just asked, you know, like, so any of you write like a root song or whatever? And I said, like, yeah, well, you know, I... I I do a little good thing. I'm so what? So let me go in and hear it. And the minute I started, you know, then, you know, at the time in the studio on drums, it was, um, it was, I'm trying to remember, Paul Castic, you know, legendary yeah, Paul yes, Castic. Yes. So he was there. Christopher Birch, who would go on to produce one of the most important dancehall albums of all time for us. That was Shaggy Hot Shots. Mm -hmm. He was the main producer on that, but he was a young guy just coming to Kingston from Montego Bay at the time, working with Dean Fraser. And then, of course, there's... Not, not famous at the time. Not, not famous at the time. <laughs> also was in the studio on bass was Mikey Fletcher, who also for many years played with Shaggy and was mm -hmm. one of the principal musicians on that Hot Shot album. So you see, a lot of people were there that was set to be legendary, both before they were legendary. <laughs> And that's how that song was recorded because he said that, you know, just so it was recorded the, the, the first day that I went in, you know, so nobody knew the song. So everybody else in the group just sang background. Plus, they didn't necessarily like the song because it was roots and they, that was not what their vibe, but it was my vibe, you know, because mm -hmm. I've always wanted to be the Peter Tosh, you know, just, just to have the girls in yes, background yes. and, mm -hmm. you know, standing up for righteousness and yes, truth. Yes, and yes. that was more what was inside of me. But, uh, uh, from that point, when you started as, uh, for example, when you wish, when you reached that first album, yeah, we can see that uh, you you have a blending of those themes. I mean, mm. we can perceive the roots, but we can perceive also something that is. Uh, and I also talked to Hafa with mm. uh, yesterday. I think that you were uh, arriving at the airport and we were talking, we were texting, and I said that. Uh, you have also, at the same time, you have that quality that is something of love songs of mm. that I I I I like very much, very much. Yeah. Because you know, you. just the same as in, in Kingston, in Jamaica, here we all always uh, artists of uh, reggae artists they feel that pressure of not being too soft mm. by the their peers. So if you have Love songs that are beautiful, beautifully uh, sung. Yeah. As you, you know, as you do, it, uh, sometimes, we, sometimes, most of the time, we, we feel that pressure of not being uh, roots enough. <laughs> Did you yeah. feel that? Yeah. You know what? That pressure was out there, but I was never one to, you know, let others decide what I was going to do. You know, if I feel it, if I'm in love with the, the, the music of it, I just go ahead and, and do my thing. Because what I think is, you know, we have many artists out there, but the one thing that you can bring to the table that you're sure no one will turn up with is yourself. You know, and, and this, the, the song that I sing, I think, represents me. You know, so as long as I do that, if somebody wants a doing series of vibe, it must span. The, because if you're singing about life, you know, Love, relationship, all of that is still a part of life. So we can't just be singing about, you know, the roots and the thing. Because, you know, throughout history, even the backbone of the civil revolution has always had man and woman relationship, especially in our history. You understand? Because a lot of things that could have been done to forward the civil rights movement were done by women because the men were so intensely watched. So the women had to take charge of these things. So we have that intertwining and that relationship. And I don't think the music should be any different. I agree, totally. Yeah, man, because it's as hard as we can be, you know, we have to have soft times with our women. And that's just life. But but you mentioned something that, uh, if you allow me to oh, go insist ahead. on that point. Uh, 
but you have something that is very specific. You, you, you talked about that very clearly mm. as the way you know that your music will sound and will represent. But uh, you do that in a way that only you can do. <laughs> This is very important because when, yeah. we, when we, we start to, to uh, get more, how can I say, just a second, when we get in touch with your work mm -hmm. in life, as I did recently, Yeah. We can perceive that you have something that for me unique that is I I was trying also trying to to configure it with one word to define. Yeah. And finally I get the word that is serenity. I think that you have that quality uh, that allows you to talk about roots things. Yeah. But also also you have that great characteristic that is that great uh, aspect that is uh, doing love songs and talking about that other part of life as you said mm. that is very important in a way that is very uh, calm a very calm way and i i think this is very important to say that because uh we we felt pr uh, some pressure in order to be such Uh, mm. rude boys and, and and stuff like that and to to look like a rude boy and say things and you you have that aspect that is very well defined in your work yeah because you know i try to sing truth you know i try to sing truth in whichever form it, it, it comes through you know so when i sing a song like augustone is because you know we existed inside that space so we can pretend to be many things But when you come with the truth of what you are, you know, this is, this is my truth. This is not something of a fad. You know, this is not me trying to look like a road boy or whatever. Yeah. This is just how life is and this, this is how we live and we made it through and whatever. And when I sing, you know, uh, about um, love songs or whatever, it's because these are real feelings that all of us can relate to. And as long as it's relatable, then I think, you know, people tend to grasp the truth a little bit easier and a little bit more accepting, you know. I've never been one to be singing about, you know, yo, you're singing, you're just on the avenue with a big car and 10 girls or whatever. <laughs> That was not my reality. Maybe somebody can sing it and it makes sense, you know, because it's their reality, but it was never mine, you know. And I, and I think I try to put it in, put the music in a way to that, you know, it's respectful of everyone, you know. Is respectful of a man, respectful of a woman, you know, and I like to think that what I do is family music, you know, and that is important to me. Family music is very important to me. It's nice that you can put in a Dwayne Stevenson CD with your kids in the car, and you don't have to skip any song thinking that, you know, this is something that maybe the children don't have to listen to, you know, so that's important to me. That's another thing. But unfortunately, we, we've seen too much of that, I mean. Uh, people that uh, could not uh, come to terms with that reality. So uh, there's a lot of, uh, especially the, the younger generations. Mm. And I was about to ask that because we are about the same age, I guess. Yeah. So we were caught in the middle of a change. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd like to take one example. We, we, we made a tour, as I told you in, yeah. before the show with is higher vibration so in one of these shows Hafa, in one of these shows we had the opportunity to play with is higher vibration in the guise of protege 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 yes 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 protege and it was clear that we 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 could see the generational gap mm -hmm. in terms of how to do that the music how it sounds and all that stuff and also the the way things are written Mm -hmm. are described the realities are described so yeah. uh, we we so we stopped and then we started to talk about that with the guys of his high vibration and uh, some at some point somebody said to me the sound of his high vibration is colonial <laughs> it sounded so uh, not, not in necessarily in a bad way but mm -hmm. in, in, in uh, It was more a mention to s the way music was made before them. Yeah. 
And uh, we see not only in reggae music, but uh, this is in general, all, all stuff, all music all around the world, that many young people are not concerned about if the music can be listened by the whole family. Yeah, listen, I think a lot of that has to do with uh, capitalism. I say capitalism because it seems like it's not, but a lot of these younger people are trying to get radio play. Radio play is now driven by advertisers and their money. Advertisers and their money are into hype and just raw energy and all of these things that, you know, and they're trying to get to the, the younger minds. And they think the only way to get to the younger minds is to bend the minds to get to them, to make it easier on them. You understand? So, for instance, while you might have, even in Jamaica right now, a lot of root reggae music being played, they play it on a, on a Sunday. They play it in the days at a certain time. But once you get to the high energy time and the time when the advertisers are spending their money, you realize that the whole thing changed to this foolishness that we they, they, they're trying to, to, to push on the kids, you understand? Because in the advertisers' mind, oh, kids, they won't, you know, grasp reggae and reggae is slow and they're into energy and they want dance all and fun and flair and thing. And it's driven by the advertisers' money. Now, funny enough, those people are just trying to make their jobs easier because I've been to Kenya and 70% of what's on the radio in Kenya and the FM stations are reggae music. Most of it's roots, clean, family music. And that is what's being played in the, the same energy time that the ones in certain areas are running from. That's what's being played there. So that's what the people use to, that's what they enjoy, that's what they support. And that's the difference. Yes, most definitely. Would you like some coffee? <laughs> oh, no, I'm good. <clears throat> You know, man, that I cannot do anything without coffee. So I'm going to have Sergio. my coffee. Once uh, Harrison Stafford, the lead singer from Groundation, told mm -hmm. me something that is totally related to what you guys are talking about now. Mm -hmm. uh, it was exactly this. If, you know, the market and the industry, they invest the same kind of, uh, the same amount of money in positive music, then instead of, you know... Yeah any other things, it would sell equal or even more because exactly. music is a part of life of everyone yes. in a daily basis. So the that point is, is the capitalism and, you know, this push for uh, things that are not related to, to our lives uh, in a more, you know, intimate way mm -hmm. is what makes, uh, let's say, crap music so big and exactly. sometimes roots music that talk about the reality and talk about people's feelings uh, look like it's uh, you know uh it's lower less, but it's not yeah it's less but it's, it's not it's not because i mean the truth is right now even in jamaica when you go to all the rural places and i say all the rural places that is jamaica is not kingston and montego bay and manchester that's a small part of the population. So while that set of people might be all up in this thing and the hype and the thing, but when you go to the little community concerts and stuff in the rural areas, the same artists that supposedly are the number one artists in Jamaica, they cannot come to these shows. Nobody wants to see them. Nobody wants to hear that kind of a music and it does not relate to them, which is why right now there's such a divide between the music from grassroots people, young and old. Because a lot of the, even younger people in the grassroots areas do not support that kind of music that is played on the radio. They are just there for the ride because they don't own the radio. You understand? Yep. I mean, look, for instance, country music. Country music has been the number one selling music now since forever. They make the most money. They have the biggest tours that have everything. And the one thing that they keep consistent is that country music has always been, will always be family music. When someone goes to a country and western concert anywhere, whether it be Sweden, which is big on country also, or in the United States or in Canada and those places, it's a major thing because grandma is there, 
the four kids are there, the mother and the, uh, and the father is there, the aunt, the uncle are there. So everyone is there. They partake in the music. They grow up in the music. So therefore, the next generation, you don't have to define anything else because that's what they used to, that's what they're into. And it just, the, the wheel just keeps on turning. So there's no divide. You understand? But a lot of what's going on now in, in, in our music, they're deliberately trying to divide because they're trying to make their job easier, you know? Our music is saying, well, you know, whiskey is an adult thing, big people thing, but they want kids from 17 to start drinking it because that's a large part of the market and before they wait till the kids become 21, they're trying to force it on them. You understand? And that's what they wanted and that's a part of the reason why they cannot afford for certain kind of music that upwell certain standard to be played on the radio when they're spending their money. And that's the truth of it. Yes, that is. Here in Brazil, we are experimenting. We are feeling a, a great, a great, great divide in that sense. For example, when I talk to my daughter, you are, mm. are, are you a father? Yes, I am. How many kids? I have two kids. I have two. A, a, my son is um, 17 right now, you know, and my daughter is 12. <clears throat> my daughter is 18. Yeah, well, yeah. And, and, she, and she keeps, <laughs> she keeps uh, showing me, yeah. bringing that music for me. And then we, we have a, 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 in, in, our, in our home, mm -hmm. my wife is a teacher. So we are all the time talking about ideas yeah. all the time. So it's different from the average home. Yeah, I understand. <clears throat> then she is very able to detect those that that those strange vibes mm -hmm. and she keeps telling me dad listen to this listen to this listen to this my my friends are listening to this this is very very strange so in, in brazil it's very uh a very difficult time for this situation because yeah listen i remember once i was when i knew that there was a serious problem is i was home one night you know i fell asleep watching one of them i think it was probably mtv at one of the stations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I woke up to a video that apparently it, prem it premiered early in the night, but I slept out that part. So I got it, and of course it was running constantly mm -hmm. throughout the night. And the song was Pretty Boy Swag by Soldier Boy. Mm -hmm. And I was there, and at the, the video started, it was a beautiful video and everything. And you know, the guy was there, and he started saying, Pretty Boy Swag. And I was waiting for the song to start, and then the video ended. <laughs> I, realized, I realized that was the song, <laughs> Pretty was Boy Swag, and that was the words. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and by the next two weeks, this was the, the number one song in, in, in all the um, urban charts and everything, which a lot of those urban charts and things only affect minorities. The other thing is the minorities are what, you know, fill out them urban charts and that is what they're feeding to these people who are already having problems in their communities. Yeah. Pretty boy swag yeah. and that was it. You understand? So this is the craziness I'm telling you about. And I, I, I couldn't, yeah. I was in shock. I said, but this is the end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in fact, that <clears throat> in a strange way um, motivates us to, to keep Uh, singing what we sing and telling well, we, we things that to, we sing. We, we have to, you know, we just need, yes. you just need to get a few young minds and once they come, you know, they'll figure out how to get the energies because they know their peers better than us, you know. Because remember, at this age, you know, they're hiding things from us. <laughs> they're not telling us what they're really thinking. Yeah. They're hiding stuff from us. So they they know their peers. So what we have to do is just try to, you know, get in a few young acts and, you know, really get them up and running so they can translate a lot of what we're trying to, you know, put through in our music to the, the next generation. And I think once we, we, we can do that, then, you know, it would be a lot clearer, the path ahead. Uh, I was about to ask you uh, uh, about that, uh, two different experiences that you have uh, as an interpreter with mm -hmm. the Wailers and as an author uh, in the whole of your work, mm -hmm. your, your al albums and then your, your singles. Yeah. But you also have some interesting versions. Yeah. Like um, Think Twice. Yeah, 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 Think Twice. Um, you know, the thing about me It's is that... It's beautiful, simply beautiful. 
Yeah, but there's a reason for that though. You see, I've never tried to compete with the original acts. I've never done it. I have never tried to compete with the original acts because the reason why people fell in love with the song initially was because they loved what they do. What I offer is an option, a Dwayne Stevenson option. A good one. Let, yeah, me, exactly. let me tell you that. <laughs> because, listen, the thing about these songs are, if you can't do it justice, if you really think in the back of your mind and in your heart that you can't do it justice, you should leave it alone. You understand? And what I, you know, because I love the songs so much, I think it comes out, it come across when I try to reproduce it, you know, and try to make it my own somewhat. But I have never tried to, you know, to try to outdo the original. I simply do a Dwayne Stevenson version of the songs. And I think that's why a lot of people, you know, find themselves falling in love with this song all over again, because it doesn't, has anything to do with the love that they had for it prior to me producing the songs. And I think that's very important with you when you're trying to do these songs. I mean, I remember doing a project for um, Pentos years ago. This is the first time I've worked with Pentos. Mm -hmm. It was a tribute album for um, Beris Hammond. And at the end of the album, I remember Beris came to me and said, listen, all the guys who did the tribute songs are excellent, excellent um, singers and performers in their own right. But yours is close to the heart to me because of what you have done. And that's because, you know, I interpreted the song. This is a song of, oh, like, you're not going to out-sing Barry's Hammond. It's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? Instead, you... Yeah, so we, we, we broke it and said, listen, I don't want to sing it that way yet. I don't want to, to sing it this way. And we broke it into piano and a little bit. So, you know, people used to it bouncing and everything. And I just simply said, it. a man must be strong to live long. Take the negative vibe, try to stay alive. And I never said it will be easy living in a system that you can't win. But by the time you're old and slow, folks hardly want to say hello. And since you've got your pride, You'll get by, you believe in the black beauty. Which is totally different <laughs> from what maybe even Beris was thinking. So you found my shit on the studio. Love thanks, right? Lovely, lovely, lovely. Yeah. So lovely. I think that's that's the secret to to you know always trying to do a good rendition. Uh, of a song I, I don't try to compete with the original singers because one I, I don't want to do a song unless I'm totally in love with the, with the music so I have to be a fan of the original so the last thing you're trying to do is to defile the original it doesn't make sense not at all uh, but uh, uh, but also this is also rare when we have an artist that has a great represented represented uh, a great uh, relationship, an intimate relationship with their own work as an author. Mm -hmm. That's your case. But at the same time, a great interpreter of songs of other people. <laughs> this is very rare. You know thank that. You, you know that. You, people keep you. people keep telling this. I mean, a, a few people have said you know, that they love that um, what I do. But I'm just telling you my process. You know, um, you know, you just hope that you can do the songs at a level that even the original authors and performers of the song would, would, would enjoy themselves. And as a musician, you'd want that for your music, you know, because I've written songs for other people. And maybe the reason why I haven't done so for many more people than I have done so is because you want to see the best representation of your work. So I, I try to do that. I love Cottage in the Grill. Yeah, <laughs> I told you that. I told you that. Love yeah, that. Man, yeah, yeah. Tyrone Taylor was a boss. So, you know? so be, can you can you please sing a cappella for us just a little bit? From my little cottage in the grill, I wrote these lines to you. And from that little cottage in the grill. 
I realize I love you still. <laughs> é, geral aí no estúdio. <laughs> yeah, Beautiful man. images of the of the the video. Oh, yeah, I love yeah, that. Yeah. I love that. You know, it was so easy to do the song because I mean, the song was shot, the, the video was shot down in the grill. You know, um, at one of those cottages that Tyrone Taylor actually used to rent at some mm. at one point in his life because he used to. He's from Saint Elizabeth, but he used to uh -huh. spend a lot of time in Negril because mm -hmm. those days a lot of guys made a lot of money singing in the hotels, which is how he yes. ended up I I in Negril. And Tyrone Taylor, to me, was he was just a, a, a different stroke. He never came to town. He never lived in 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 town where the music was. Mm -hmm. You know, he just came, he did his recording, and then he left. So it was, he, I think. In a sense, he kept that vibe from now on at end and he translated that into his music, you know what I mean? So, and, you know, he was, he was just like, he was one of the, the like, the, the, the sexier <laughs> music, you know, his music is, is that's be the best way to describe it, you know, yes, his yes. music is sexy. Yes, <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? It, it, in it, a positive way. Yeah. It's in a beautiful way. Listening to his music takes you on a beach, you know, white sand beach with, with waves crashing against the sand, you know, on a moonlit night, you know, and that's the vibe that his music g gives to you. So I was trying to at least represent somewhat that same kind of vibe, you know what I mean? But a little bit differently, but of course, you know, um, not take the essence because the essence of what I loved in the song was that it took me out of Augustown to a journey to the beach, you know what I mean? And that is what I wanted to still translate to the people, you know what I mean? And luckily, I actually met him that the first time performing that song live, he was in the audience. Mm. Yes, it was in the grill. It was myself, Taurus Riley, and Etana that was doing a show. We just, we all just, you know, had our albums out, and that was one of the, the first shows that we did you know, together. And he was in the audience. So, so that's, I met him. You know, it was a nice guy, man, you know, unfortunate, you know, Magical. time with that, yeah. <laughs> But, yeah. Lovely song, lovely song. Thank you, man. But uh, have you. Uh, in, in at any time in, during your career, mm -hmm. because you have you had that experience with the Whalers playing mostly yeah. Bob Marley mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, am I right? Yes. Okay, so mostly as an interpreter at that situation. I mean, you you didn't bring any of your material, your music, to the presentation of the Whalers. No, uh, initially, no. I was supposed to be only the the, the um, I was just a like guest performer in an opening act for the Whalers, and then I should I was supposedly singing one song with them which is a song that we did for the World Food Program together a song that I wrote Okay. me and a, a friend of mine called Boltar Salomon we wrote the song and then they invited me to sing the song as a part of their set but you know music vibe good and energy and everything I just ended up on stage as, <laughs> as we, we do you know <laughs> the music is good enough at some point we're going to be on the stage and that's how we ended up doing more as a part of the, the, the show and, and stuff. But even when I was doing the songs, I never up, I was never one to be on stage trying to, you know, you know, strut across the stage looking like Bob because I don't believe in them things. You know, and, and I think I have too much respect for what they did in their time and their music to go and try be a, a, a replica of what they're doing. Plus, we don't need any more of that neither because all these children sound like him. The last thing you want to be <laughs> yes, yes, is the yes. 21st, yes, the 24th yes. Marley. We don't need it. Yes. So, uh, but you you returned to your. It was about the second album, that the tour with the Willis. After the second album. After yes. the second album. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you you came back to your work with the third yeah. album. Yeah. And some singles that I saw. Yeah. Uh, and, and now talking about specific, specifically about that phenomenon of the, the global market now. Mm -hmm. Did you feel the pressure to, to, to keep uh, releasing singles or are you planning, for example, right now to, to release an, an entire, entire album? No, I'm doing it well. Right now, this year might be a lucky year for, for, for my fans because my all intentions is to, and I, I have an album that's been held up for two years a little over mm -hmm. two years because of the pandemic, pandemic. first uh, it was supposed to come out from be out from I think late 2008 but then I got you know a little bit of a health issue uh, sorry 2019 then I had a little bit of health issue then I, it was held up for a few months and by the time it was supposed to have been out in March of 2000 then the pandemic came about so it's it's been held up for two years, 
And while in the pandemic, you know, I couldn't just sit down doing nothing. So I ended up doing another album with um, Penthouse Records, that's Donovan German of Penthouse Records. Mm -hmm. So my whole intention is to be getting out both of these albums before the year ends. Because I just think that, you know, people wait such a long while for a full project from me and everything. Sometimes you have to just give back for the sake of the music, you know. So the first album will be out at the end of um, February is mm -hmm. Exalted Jolites, you know, which okay. is a 14-track um, album. 14-track? Yeah. Because I, I believe in that that seems fair to the, 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 the masses, to me, you know what I mean? So that you would give them enough, because people spend the money, mm, hard-earned money, that is, you know, and you should give, get, give them equal value. And I believe in that. But then okay. by the me year too. end, our latest early... 23, I would want the second album, which is unnamed yet. Unnamed yet. Yeah, <laughs> unnamed yet, with another one journey to be out. But right now, the focus is to get out a full-length album, Exile to Jedi. Okay. Um, but, singles are good. Yeah, I mean, the, in the intermediate point, because I did some because of the, the, the COVID thing, and you just want to get something out there to people to just jam to and to help them get through the time, you know what I mean? But I, I still believe in full-length um, projects. Yes, because I was the singles are nice, but uh, the full album always <coughs> tell a full story, right? Yes, yes exactly. Yes. It's something that uh, I also think it's really important because nowadays a lot of the artists <coughs> are focusing more on digital numbers, like in getting on playlists and uh, staying on, like uh, increasing the numbers. But sometimes that is not so good to deliver a whole idea of what's going on to their fans. So. I love this approach that mm. you have to balance uh, singles and albums sometimes. Mm -hmm. it, mm. It's always good. Of course, of course. Uh, here, I, I think with the youngers, many artists that, that came uh, to our podcast, mm -hmm. mainly from rap music, um, I would say 20 years or less. Mm -hmm. And they are totally focused on singles, 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 and those numbers, those numbers. And one of them... Mm -hmm. uh, out of nothing, he said, "No, I'm worried about uh, the whole, the meaning of the whole project. Exactly. So ha there has to be a meaning, a line of no uh, one will know. <clears throat> Sorry, no one will know what you truly represent with singles. Yes, and because if you put out a single now and you think that you can put out the 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 other part of the idea in another single a few months down the line, by the time the second one comes out, people totally forgot what you're talking about the first one. Yes, so it, it doesn't relate." You understand? So that's not a good way of building an audience. You understand? If you want to build an audience, put a whole idea out there so people can tune into the idea, build a relationship with the music, the album, whatever. And this is how you start to get opportunities to tour and such, you know. So it's a shortcut. It might work for the producers. So a lot of producers <laughs> try to push it. Oh, yeah, you should do singles because, yeah, of course. you Once again, capitalism. Yeah, you read the singles with 10 guys and whatever. That, it, the numbers add up for you. <laughs> But it doesn't reflect good for the artist. It's nice if you get a one song and it run away or whatever. But then, think about even it. You get a song, you, 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 this is your fourth singles in five years. And, you know, the song run away and become a mega song or whatever. And then you get a tour and you have to do a, a full length performance of an hour. What do you do then? Of course. Because no one will want to hear anything else from you except that one song. And once the song is gone, you come off the stage. Yes, yes. You have no relate. They have no relationship with you. They don't know you. In the sense, all they want from you is that one song, and then you can leave. What do you do for the next forty odd minutes? Yes, yes. This is a problem. Exactly. At least in this very point, reggae music mm. is also always always mm -hmm. uh, have great great people that are most most of the time. Having an album, having their own yeah. repertoire, this is this is magical. I I I can see that from from my experience, mm -hmm. 27 years playing reggae music in Brazil. Uh, we see even the younger guys. Yeah, they have their their own music, their own songs, and, and they don't even believe in having songs that are written by anybody else. 
This is oh. magical. This is yeah. so important. I, I mean, for the for the movement, for the yeah, it definitely. The it's, you know, it's always good that when somebody is you know really in love with their own work or, or, or whatever and believe in their own material. You know what I mean? But sometimes, just for a different vibe, you can bring on um, other mm -hmm. writers because mm -hmm. I have done that. It's not because yeah, I can't yes, write yes. everything myself, but I believe in offering more to listening artists. And sometimes help will give you a different perspective because ultimately you only have one brain and one brain will function one way. And after a while it be begins to come out, well, not necessarily the same way, but the same energy, the same vibe because it is you. Now, getting someone to knock heads with will, you know, alter the, the, the direction of your music somewhat and everything. And if it's just even the essence of how you do it or what is the, the end product, product it, it works. So it's nothing to frown on or to try and say that, you know, well, it, it makes you less because it doesn't. It absolutely doesn't, you know. But I mean, when you're young and you're just trying to get your foot in and everything, it's a good way to think, you know. But ultimately, you learn that that's not necessarily <laughs> the way to it takes, go. Take some time. time. Yeah, it does. It does because you know when you're young, you you, you you like your product, especially if you're getting good response from it or whatever. You know, you have to really you know believe in what you're doing. But I mean, I've written for many artists out there in Jamaica. I've done written you know major songs from Jack Your. Luciano, I've done mm -hmm. more recently, Alba Rosi, um, Barry Salmon himself, Nesbitt, and many of artists that names are not so so forward, but you know, I do a lot of writing. So I can tell you that it will not take away from, you know, it not, it's not a red mark against your reputation. It won't be. Yes. How's your relation with those guys you, you mentioned, Alba Rosi, for example? He came to Brazil several times. Yeah, very together. respectful, man. I've known Albert Rosie. Listen, we've known each other before any of us had albums out. I met Albert Rosie many years ago um, as an engineer. We were working. I think that's the first album I actually wrote on for someone else aside from myself. The album was called Serious Time from Luciano. And we mm -hmm. went down to G-Jam. In those days, G-Jam was brand new in Jamaica. Jan Baker had just come to Jamaica, setting up shop <clears throat> from... England, where we, where we had great success, you know, from Drew Hill to PM Dan and then people he used to work with. So, Albert Rose was the engineer down there. And at that point, you know, he was really into, you know, like the dub sounds and everything. It was long before anybody else was doing it. You know, so, so that's how long I've known Albert Rose. So, we've been friends for all, throughout all those years. So, he had a, a great, a long experience uh, producing and oh, yes, mixing man. and all that Listen, stuff. Albert Rose. Before being an artist? Before being an artist. But the thing about it, he started years of, in, back in Italy, singing Italian music, whatever that is. <laughs> <laughs> no disrespect to them, clearly, but I, I don't know. I know but I, know. I think it's a cultural, some more of, of a cultural <laughs> sound in at Italian music. And that's how he started. He was a member, just like me, of a group. Yes. And then he fell in love with reggae. He ran after Jamaica. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and he became an engineer. And, you know, so... Albert Rosie built his house of reggae from ground up. You know, it wasn't yes. that he just came into the music. And, no, he went through the, the process. He was an engineer. Then, you know, started experimenting with sounds as a producer and whatever. And then he became the artist that we know now. And he still does a lot of stuff in, in production. Cause he, today? Yeah, because he, he, even Omi, you know, um, all those songs Omi did, the album that made him famous. A lot of the work that started out with, with um, Albert Rosie. He has done work for Chris Martin and many international acts. So he's still in studio doing a lot of stuff and he's still doing dub. I mean, if you look at his Instagram, you still see him there <laughs> fooling around. You know, so, yeah, so a lot of the, the relationship that I have with those artists are very respectful. Even with, with, with Jackie, where a lot of people have many, you know, terrible experience, they might say, with him and whatever. But I've mm -hmm. never had one of those because mm -hmm. I, maybe it's just how, you know, I approach things and how I approach people and I keep it strictly musical yes. and, you know, we have, you know, respect for each other because respect goes both ways, you know, and if someone knows that you treat them respectfully, they will in turn treat you respectfully, you know, which uh, Beres is the same thing. We have, I've basically have an open door policy with, uh, with most of the people that I work with. For me, it's very clear that you have, it's, it's, it's the truth. I'm talking Sorry. about that serenity once again. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That's important because I value that. Mm -hmm. I I even uh, tried to to persuade some of my colleagues to yeah. <laughs> to act that way <laughs> along those decades. But yeah. okay. 
Okay, that's a long way. Let's go. <laughs> Let's keep trying. Yeah, well, I mean, somebody have to get the ball rolling, and yeah. once it, it start to pick up speed, how about it change? Brazilian reggae artists mm -hmm. that you had the yeah. opportunity to work with, and or at least listen to them. Mm. What do you know about them? What what is your relation with them? Well, listen. Um, first, I, I don't totally understand. The, well, I don't understand the language. Okay, but. Not yet. You know, not yet. Ah. Not yet. But I'm working on that. Not yet. But what I respect about them is that that's just the rootness. And I love that most of the Brazilian Brazilian band still has the brass section. Because to me, that is what a lot of even the reggae in Jamaica is missing these days. Because a lot of times the budget, you know, well. Yes, I know. The promoters in Europe seem to, to start this foolishness with yes. budget and whoa, the budget. So they, what they're trying to do is to push their own people in. So there is a lack of that, 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 that brass section to me. And when you listen to Brazilian reggae, the brass section is still there in the forefront. And I thought, I think that is one of the major things that keeps reggae moving and really, you know, pushes the energy of the songs. And it, it, it still holds true here. And I love that. Like coming here when I say that, you know, we have to perform, you know, yeah, um, Rafa called me and said, well, you know, we perform in a local, but I had no problems because I know the musicians and they're highly competent musicians and they're great at what they do. You know, some people call it from some place and say, well, a local, but yeah, that will never happen, man. <laughs> 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 who, are, who are the guys that are playing with? The guys, Yuri on drums. Great, Hinato, great drummer. Yeah. yeah. Hinato, Hinato also bass, great bass player. Uh, Rema, a guitar, mm -hmm. guitar, uh, Junior and Werner on, mm. on keyboards. Mm. And, uh, also Only the some, best. Yeah. yeah. Only the best. Yeah. Some of the best here. Great guys. I played with, uh, I think that maybe all of them. Yuri is fantastic. Yeah. Mm. Yuri is great, great. Yeah, man. Just I realized great. that, that, also, that it was awesome, man. So yes. I know that from just listening to the music. So I had no problem. I was quite comfortable. You know, coming over here, a lot of places would call me with, you know, and I tell them no. There's no way in hell I would leave to, to go to certain things. But I, I know the reputations of the musicians here and I've seen it and heard it for myself. So I was quite comfortable. Yes. That's nice. It's so comforting. I mean, yeah, it, it is. It is. For it us is, as it artists. Is, it is. Because sometimes we have to play with. Uh, yeah. Due to, as you said before, but budget and all this stuff. Listen, I understand. I, I just. By touring with the Whalers, you know, I understand a lot of these markets. A lot of the, 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 the artists, they know what these artists that are big in Jamaica. They, they probably wouldn't necessarily, they don't think of anything about, oh, come down here because the money is not good. But it cannot be all about the money. And we have to balance budgets and people, livelihood and everything. Because everywhere you go, things will be different, you know. You won't, I, I've done a lot of shows on in French Guyana and whatever. There are French no five-star hotels down there. Once you leave the city and you go to the jungle to where the fans are, the people that are supporting your music and wanting to see you, there are no five-star accommodations. You know, they have good, clean places that these mm -hmm. people live in, and if them can live in there, why you can't live there one night? But the simpler things in life, it interests me. It, it's fascinating, adventurous, and so far I've never had a musician who has not absolutely and totally enjoyed the same kind of energies and vibe that we get when we go down to that places. You know what I mean? It's nice that you, you know, perform in a yes. first class club in, in, in like, you know, Berlin and you, you stay in this nice hotel and whatever mm -hmm. and you drop you to the, the, the thing in a, a Benz, but people don't always live like that. So what do we do? So with the Willis, uh, your tour was of how many shows? Uh, it was a lot. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot. Uh, they keep busy, man. They keep busy. You know, um, we toured extensively. We a lot of places here, extensively in Argentina, up to down to Chile. I've been to even to Peru and Paraguay and those places. You know, um, so but outside of that, a lot of the places that they, they went to are places that I've you know done shows a lot in America and those kind of places. But I realized even New York that I would generally go to and New York that like they would go to is, is, is one but separate. The fans are absolutely, totally different. It's a different diaspora because generally when I go, you know, I go to Caribbean people are mm -hmm. Central America and whatever. And then they, they have a lot of more Americans listening to their music and whatever and goes to their shows. 
you know, so we, we have to figure out all we also a way to bridge the gap to bring everyone mm-hmm. back together because I think now the music has such great divides all over. It's bad mm-hmm. enough we're having all these divisions because of politics, religion, and governments. The last thing we need is divisions in the music, also. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we're trying to, I've tried to figure out how to go and bridge the gap and bring everybody back together, man, to one party. Yes. That's the ultimate goal of yeah. our work. Of one course. party, man. Yes, yes. One voice. <laughs> you you also did that event on the sp- sports event. Which which one was that? I think it was a big on the stadium. Oh yes, that was yeah. um, Pan American Games. Yeah, yeah it was my. Ma- They did a, a presentation on the stadium for the Pan American Games. I remember I was on, I was watching TV. Yeah, and, and I just saw like. <laughs> Suddenly, suddenly, doing out of singing nothing. on on, t- on the TV like on the, <laughs> I was like, what what's going on? <laughs> oh yeah, that's Pan American Games. Yeah. Uh, myself, um, Ricky Martin, and he had as guest. I think at the time it was um, what's her name? This is before she became a mega star. Um, she's on the, the the she's one of the judges on that show. The Voice, is it? Mm. She was one of the early judges on that show, but but she's a mega star in the United States right now. Um, I have the tiger. I have the tiger. <laughs> yeah, her, that, yeah. yeah, but at the time she was she was new, and you know, mm-hmm. the, the Ricky Martin was a person like trying to get her out there and stuff like that. So, you know, I had the pleasure of sharing the same stage and space with those people. So that sure. was amazing, man. Yeah, amazing, you know. Dwayne Stevenson. Yeah, we are deeply grateful for your contribution to our biocast for that opportunity to, much, to know each other a, li- a little more mm. uh, and uh, on behalf of the whole crew that is Valter São Cabeça and Jorge Bill uh, we would like to thank you and I'd like you if you uh, agree to s- leave a message for people from Salvador um, the pleasure is mine, firstly, you know, for inviting me here, you know what I mean? It's always nice to get to, you know, be a little bit closer, if it's even through the media with a lot of the people that has been supporting the music. So, Salvador, firstly, I must say, no for love. Thank you very much for listening to my music. You never had to, you know what I mean? You had many options, but you still let me into your homes, into your cars, and into your hearts through my music. So, thank you very much. And as for a, a word, you know, Well, firstly, because of the whole pandemic and stuff, we have to keep strong, keep safe, you know, and keep positive thoughts. You know what I mean? Keep positive thoughts. And remember, when you're going into a room, take yourself in there with you. Because you're sure you're not going to go up there and say a replica of yourself. You understand? Be your own person. You know, live your decision, live your dream. And just, as I mentioned before, more than anything else, Keep positive thoughts and just pushing forward. Big up yourself. <laughs> Now, uh, your achievements in Portuguese. Ah, very little. Yeah. Just two, two or three. <laughs> <laughs> you know, tomorrow night, then we <laughs> might, I have a tutor coming in today. You know, so. <laughs> Rene Stephenson, thank Big you. Big up yourself, my brother. No flow. <laughs> Valeu rapaziada, esse foi o nosso BahiaCast Gravado, como vocês já sabem Acompanhando até agora esse grande Esse grande ser humano A great human being I'm telling them Thank you. Dwayne Stephenson, great artist um Grande artista, a gente está muito feliz é, De continuar o nosso trabalho aqui Nessa bancada, falando de relevância Falando de coisas positivas como o Dwayne falou aqui A gente agradece a todos vocês E a gente segue aqui na nossa, no nosso corre No BahiaCast Obrigado Rafa você é o mentor intelectual desse encontro. Obrigado. Tamo junto aí sempre. O que precisar. E tá espero bom. que possa trazer aqui vários outros artistas ainda da Jamaica e outros lugares pra gente bater esse papo aqui. Parabenizando sempre o canal pelo trabalho duro aí de todos vocês. A gente acompanha e, e dá todo o apoio sempre. Muito obrigado. Vamos Valeu, que vamos. Valeu, Serginho. Valeu, rapaziada.